So many people are looking to live happier, more stress-free lives. We provide interviews from mental health experts across various fields because we know finding quality information isn't always easy. Let's find more sanity together. Hello and welcome back to Sanity Podcast. We have another episode of our ABCT collaboration with Sanity. Uh, We have a return guest here, and if you haven't listened to his previous episodes on the inhibitory learning model and what we could be doing better with the DSM, they are very hot episodes um, of the podcast, so I highly recommend going back and checking those out. We again have Dr. Jonathan Abramowitz. Just a reminder, he is a clinical psychologist and professor of psychology and psychiatry and director of the Anxiety and Stress Disorders Clinic at the University of North Carolina. He is an internationally recognized expert on OCD and anxiety, so good thing we have you for the OCD talk, right? Um, He has published over 300 research articles, books, and book chapters in the area. Uh, Jonathan is a past president of the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies and past editor of the Journal of Obsessive, Compulsive, and Related Disorders. He is a regular presenter at professional conferences and has received numerous awards for his contributions to the field. He also has numerous NIMH research grants. John, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure. Jason, thanks for having me back. It's a pleasure. The pleasure is all mine. All right. So this is really your wheelhouse here. We're going to be talking uh, extensively um, about OCD. Um, Where I would like to get started is just very simply, what is OCD and what is it not? And and how does it look different than another anxiety disorder? disorder that that someone might come in with yeah that's a great question and it's it's a complex question because over the last uh you know 10 20 years or so there have been questions uh, raised and and debates good kind of debates in the field about what is ocd and what isn't um so i'll give you my perspective as a clinical psychologist who studies it very carefully um what is what is ocd so ocd is, you know, I, I, it is an anxiety related, uh, problem, disorder, syndrome that involves two main types of symptoms. So you have obsessions. These are unwanted, intrusive thoughts, ideas, images, and they create distress for the person, uncertainty, anxiety, fear, sometimes other sorts of distress like, um, guilt and, and, um, Oh, what's the, what's the other the other one that I'm trying to think of? Um, yeah, guilt and uncertainty, and and so these thoughts come up. They might be provoked by something in the environment, or they might just kind of spring to mind spontaneously, and they they provoke this distress and this urge to try to do something to get rid of the the intrusive thought, and that's the second main symptom um, called compulsions, compulsive rituals neutralizing behaviors, safety behaviors, different words, avoidance, anything that the person is doing to try to reduce the distress associated with the thought or remove the thought itself or prevent some sort of unwanted consequence or just to try to remove, you know, anxiety, stress, guilt, you know, whatever it is, not just right feelings. That's the other thing I was trying to think of. And we refer to those as, as compulsions. And so the person does these behaviors over and over again because the thoughts keep coming up. So they get stuck in this loop of intrusive thoughts, compulsive behaviors. We can talk about this later, but the compulsive behaviors don't work very well. They might, in the short term, make the person feel better, but then the obsessional thought comes back and, and all of that. So that's what is OCD. And um, then there are these questions about, you know, so... Does anything, any problem that involves a repetitive behavior or repetitive thinking, is that OCD? So people have proposed, well, you know, skin picking, right? We now call that excoriation. It's in the DSM. Well, well, is that related to, to OCD and um, hair pulling? We used to call it trichotillomania, right? Is that, is that, is that a form of, of OCD? Body dysmorphic disorder, where the person has obsessions about their appearance. My nose is too big. My ears are too small. And they often engage in some sort of ritual, reassurance, seeking, avoidance, behavior, checking their appearance. Is that, is that OCD? 
And at various times, and you can go to the literature and you can, you can see this is pretty interesting. At various times, folks have, um, proposed, you know, up to like, you know, 20 to 30 obsessive compulsive related disorders. Um, and it's primarily, that's primarily coming from the field of psychiatry. They look at, and we talked about this on the DSM episode, they look at disorders very superficially. Oh, it's repetitive behavior in OCD and it's repetitive behavior in trichotillomania. Oh, they must be the same thing. Clinical psychologists look at things on a different level. We look at the function of the behavior. In OCD, the compulsions are performed to try to reduce distress and anxiety associated with obsessions. In hair pulling, trichotillomania, you don't have obsessional fear the way you have it in, in OCD. And so we would say, no, no, trichotillomania, hair pulling disorder really is, is, has nothing to do with OCD. It's more of an impulse control problem. But there are some problems that do overlap with OCD. Um, body dysmorphic disorder being one of them. Health anxiety, illness anxiety, uh, is another one that looks very similar. Um, and you know, so we can, we can, I'm, I'm going on and on. We can talk a lot about that if you have specific questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I do have a question. I'm going to wrap up around. Yeah. Do you think OCD is a, a obsessive compulsive disorder is like a great name for the condition? And if you were to <laughs> rename it, like, like might you call it something else? Oh, that's a great question. It's a terrible name. The name comes from Freud. Um, Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Compulsive neurosis or obsessive neurosis like 150 years ago. And, um, and, and I think that there was some confusion about OCD and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Now we know those things are not the same thing, you know, whatsoever. Um, I mean, they, they, they do have some overlap, like people like to be clean with OCD and with OCPD, but this, the function is very different. What would I call it? So, so I think it's a terrible name. But again, it's history and tradition and all that. We're probably not changing that anytime soon. Um, I would probably, I mean, I, to me, OCD is not a singular thing. And well, I know we're going to get into this later on, but you know, there are these different kind of flavors of, of OCD. You have some people that have a fear of contamination and they engage in washing rituals. You have other people that have this, these thoughts that are like, you know, what if I'm a pedophile, right? Or, mm -hmm. or what if I murdered someone? And then they, they check to make sure that they're not a pedophile. They check to make sure that they haven't um, murdered anyone. And that is, you know, very different from the, the people who are worried about contamination. The presentation is different. The treatment is, is different. So I'm not sure that OCD is a singular thing. And maybe in another hundred years, they'll laugh at us for thinking that it was. I would love to get into this more. But to me, OCD is about you have some thought that provokes distress. You have some sort of neutralizing behavior that reduces distress. So is it a phobia of, of thoughts? Is it a, so is it more like a specific phobia? Is it like, I don't know, you have you know, like intrusive thought neutralizing disorder. I, I don't even like the term disorder as we've talked about. I don't know. It's a great question. Um, for now, we know it is OCD. Everyone knows what you're talking about when you say OCD. It's OCD. Everyone knows what you're talking to change it anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So, so now like we have a generalized anxiety disorder, which, which I mean, uh, for, for people that are learning diagnostic criteria, like GAD is kind of like a, a what they call it, a, gar a garbage bill diagnosis, where there's probably a whole bunch of different conditions that people are throwing in there. If you're unsure, you throw it in there. Yeah. Um, but, but let, let's go to like the very cardinal one where it's somebody that has excess worry, yeah. right? So they're anxious about something but they're repeatedly worrying about it, which sounds a lot like OCD, right? So why is GAD then not OCD? Right, great question. So in the DSM, what the framers of the DSM did a long time ago, I, I think DSM-3, they said that in OCD, or but let's say in, in generalized anxiety disorder, the worries, the fears are about real life circumstances. So let's suppose, you know, my relationship is on the rocks. And, and I'm having a fight with my, with my partner and I'm really worried about the relationship. That would be more GAD, right? In OCD, you see people who have, um, we would call it now relationship OCD, R, R OCD. And they have thoughts about, you know, 
Um, what if I'm not in the right relationship? You know, th- those kinds of things. And so the, the topic is the same, but here the relationship isn't on the rocks. They're, um, so it's, you know, kind of senseless and bizarre, not related to a real life thing. And so in OCD, the obsessions are thought to be kind of senseless and bizarre, whereas in GAD, they make more sense. But, you know, point well taken. Folks with GAD, they do compulsive rituals just like people with OCD. They seek reassurance. They Mm -hmm. do mental rituals. They sometimes wash their hands and ask for reassurance. So does that, you know, is there like a hard boundary between OCD and GAD? I don't think so. Again, I'm not a fan of the DSM trying to carve it, carve these problems up. I think they all overlap. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I just want to highlight this a bit more f- before, but it, there's different mechanisms of discomfort that people are trying to eliminate with, with their compulsions, which yeah. is the erasing behavior that the person does. So one of them is to erase the fear or, or increase the certainty that the fear won't, won't happen. Um, is my uh, grandma going to die? Uh, if I wash my hands, grandma won't die, and I can feel more certain that grandma won't die, even if it's not logically connected. Um, but it could also be just a sense of it not being right or just being uncomfortable. Uh, a- am I missing any other ones that you would put in here? Because the, the, the uncomfortableness is not like, oh, something bad is going to happen. And you'll see this a lot in kids. I mean, you see it in adults, but I see it a lot in kids. Yeah. Um, a- any other major discomforts to, to cover here? Yeah. So, right. We think about like harm. So people do rituals for harm reduction, right? So let me do this so that nothing bad happens, like preventing some sort of disastrous consequence to yourself or to someone else. Like, like you said, also reducing that sense of like, not just right. Like things have to be symmetrical and aligned. Otherwise it just doesn't feel right. You, you sometimes see, um, uh, like a sense of disgust, right? So some people with contamination obsessions, they're not so much worried that they're going to get sick. It's just more like, oh, these germs are disgusting and I can't stand to have these thoughts that the disgusting germs are on me. Um, and, and again, there's some nuances with all of those, particularly the harm reduction. Sometimes it's a fear that I'm going to act on a thought. Sometimes it's a fear that some magical bad luck is going to happen. Um, so there's so many different nuances. And again, are these all the same thing? Currently, we think of them all as OCD, but there's research showing that there are lots of important differences if you really dive into them. Maybe they're, again, maybe in 100 years, they're going to laugh at us thinking that we group them all together. Yeah, well, I mean, we very much do that looking backwards. We're like, how did we think that, you know, freezing people and freezing cold water and then boiling them would would cure mental illness and some of the other, th- I mean, that I think that, that might be a tamer thing that we've, <laughs> that, that our field has done. Um, yeah. Has well, done in the past. Yeah. And, and we shouldn't be, um, what, so, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not narcissistic, but we, we shouldn't think so much of ourselves that it stops with us, right? Certainly, when we're all gone, there will be folks that sneer at, at what we thought and did and all of that. Yeah. yeah and that's okay. I, that's how it works. No, I think, I think it's a really, um, a really good point. So, just to give like a spanning, because people know about like, maybe listening people don't know about Jack Nicholson and as good as it gets. Um, <laughs> and I might be aging myself a bit, but but people know about the, the stereotypical don't step on cracks, uh, you know, wash my hands, keeping everything straight, uh, checking stoves, checking locks, checking windows, making sure that the car door windows are closed in the rain and and things like that. Uh, you mentioned pe- um, uh, fear, fear of being a, a pedophile, yeah. uh, relationship OCD. Uh, What are some other different types of OCD that people might not be familiar of that they should be keeping their radar out for? Yeah. So a big one is a fear of of like violence. What if I, um, you know, I'm I'm a gentle person, but what if I lose control and I harm someone, I stab someone, you know, stab my wife while she's sleeping next to me or something like that. Um, Another big one that we're seeing now is the fear of like, um, doing some sort of like emotional harm to someone. A, a big example is like, what if I use like a racial slur and didn't realize it and I called someone a terrible racist name or, or you know, sexist or something like that. Some of that is like the fear of being, you know, canceled, right? Mm-hmm. Um, just the, the fear of offending other people. That's 
I've seen more and more of that over the last few years, which I think dovetails with, you know, more of a, of an emphasis just in the world on like diversity and equity and anti-racism and, and things like that. These, these, um, obsessions that come up are very tied to culture, right? Tied to the things that we see in our, in our culture. Um, so, so there's that. Uh, well, we mentioned the, the relationship thing. That's one that's also gotten more attention over the past, you know, decade or so. Um, Oh, why can't I think of these things when I? Mean, I so mean, like not being able to trust your memory when, when you when you look back at things. Yeah, um, what if I forgot something important? That's a big one. There was one that was on the tip of my tongue, and then we got talking about something else. Uh, mm -hmm. Harm, emotional I, harm. I had people that yeah. scared that they might become a mass shooter. Um, you yeah. know, which is part of the harm. Uh, checking emails or um, essays for curse words or for sexual words not to do something perverse or crude yeah and then similarly with like racial slurs what if i you know mm -hmm. was emailing someone and i throw in a racial slur or a curse word or ex exactly and they spend mm -hmm. lots of time checking the again like we didn't have email 30 years ago now we have it and people can check and when you delete email it's not really deleted so you can actually go back in and still check it yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, fear of impulsively stealing, impulsively punching somebody, impulsively quitting. I've seen like I'm going to get so so lack of sleep in my job that I'm going to impulsively quit, and it's going to it's going to ruin my life. I, I one thing I have my trainees do is check out the Y box on the on the, the they have the different the checklist because yeah. I think it, it's um, I'm just thinking what's on there: fear of pestilence, fear of bodily fluids, uh, fear of catching. Um, diseases i mean the, the list like a, as big as we have human fears it could plug into ocd and it changes with our culture and what our culture is scared of exactly and and it's it changes different across cultures right fears that we don't even think of in the united states folks in you know the middle east or you know asia or something they they have those kinds of fears and we know people with different religions have different fears if you're mm -hmm. If you're Christian, you know, you might have a fear of what if I am not good with, with, with God and not going to be saved, right? But if you're Muslim or Jewish, you're not worried about being saved because that's not part of the Muslim or Jewish religion. Keeping mm -hmm. kosher among Keeping Jews kosher. is a, a very common obsession that we see. What if I mixed milk and meat and broke the, that rule by mistake? But you would never see a Christian worried about that because it's just not part of their, uh, you mm -hmm. know, their culture. Well, I mean, highlighting scrupulosity, which is, you know, with, with, with the, the kosherness that you were talking about, you like, like people might think, well, what does that even look like? You have someone that is throwing out dishes because if the dishes get contaminated, let's say yeah. you need to toss those dishes because, because they're no longer kosher. So people will repeatedly throw out dishes or clean in order to do it or, or potentially pray or do other or or offload the cleaning to somebody else or somebody compulses for them, which only works for a short period of time until that becomes um, ineffective. But it, it's amazing how morphable, I don't know if that's a word, but how morphable OC OCD is and how it could really latch onto anything that is important to you. That, and that's that's a, a key factor. It's got to be there. I think there in my own kind of, you know, clinical work, and I guess we have some data on this from the field, but there are a number of important like ingredients that have to be present for someone to develop an obsession. And I think that the key one is that it has to be important. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you don't see scrupulosity among people who are non-believers. There'd be no reason to, or at least you don't see religious, you see moral scrupulosity, but you don't see religious scrupulosity among, you know, you wouldn't see someone who's afraid of, of like we were talking about, what if I broke the, the kosher rules among someone who's not, not Jewish um, or who's not religious at all. So it's got to be important to you. There has to be like some sort of code of, of rules and that you're supposed to follow, right? Like, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of, we see in postpartum women and, and men who are new dads, we see um, fears of like, what if I do something to harm the, the, the baby, right? And one of the big obsessions that we see is I have this thought that I'm going to shake the baby. And of course, mm -hmm. that's one of the huge no-nos, right? Don't shake the baby. At least when I was, you know, when my kids were being born, that was like the big thing that they told us a million times. Never shake a baby. Of course, you wouldn't shake a baby. But they say that there's, you know, that's like a big thing. So it's easy to have obsessions about it. Um, and I think also there needs to be some sort of like consequence that to one degree or another is kind of like un, 
I guess, unknowable or uncontrollable, or there's, there's like an element of uncertainty to it. And again, going back to scrupulosity, what if I'm not right with God? Right. And, and I can't know that. I can't ask God, Hey, are, are we good? Am I saved? Right. There are just certain things. Contamination, right? There's germs. You can't see the germs, right? Um, checking. Did I harm someone? Will I harm someone? Well, no one knows the future. Mm-hmm. And, and as we'll, you know, talk about a big part of treatment of OCD is learning how to be better with that, that uncertainty, that those doubts. Um, and I'm thinking about another someone driving a car and being worried that they hit somebody and saying, well, how do I know that I, I, I could hit somebody and I didn't notice I did hear a bump and then they check around the car. They look under the hood to see if there's any blood or hair yeah. and, you know, and, um, and, uh, things like that. And, and I think another common thread with OCD is that it's going to ruin my life. At least the fear based OCD I'm going to. But, well, how do I know I'm not going to become a pedophile or I am a pedophile and then I'm going to get caught and I'm going to destroy a child's life yeah. and I'm going to end up in jail yeah. and my wife and my kid are going to be without me and my, my child is going, life is going to be destroyed. So there could of, often be this component, my life or for a lot of people, someone else's life will be destroyed. Like parents worry that their kids' lives will be destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, again, there's, there's uncertainty about that too. How, like everyone at some point, if you watch enough TV or movies or books, you're going to be exposed to pedophilia, right? You're going to be exposed to some story about it. And you're going to think, well, what if I did that? <gasps> oh no. Does that mean I'm a pedophile? Cause I had that thought or another one that we see is, you know, a straight person has a thought. What if I'm really gay? And sometimes gay people have thoughts. What if I'm really straight? But everyone has, you know, thoughts, whether you're gay or straight, you have thoughts about being with some member of the same sex or a member of the Mm -hmm. opposite sex. It's just normal to have that. And not every time, you know, that you have a thought that goes against your actual sexual preference, does that mean that that's that's who you are? But how do you... How many gay thoughts do I have to have until I'm actually gay? When when is that... You know, when 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 do you cross that line? There, there's not a hard and fast boundary. Um, it's very subjective, and to a person, to most people, that's you know, people know who they are. For folks who have OCD, it becomes very complicated. They're trying to figure that out, and they really focus on where's that boundary and how close am I? And they get well, as we're talking about, they get caught up in doing rituals to try to figure that out. Uh, and that, that's a great point. That many of the thoughts that people with OCD struggle with most of us think about. Yeah. You know, so I, I live in New York City. I'm in Manhattan. I'm in my Manhattan bedroom right now. A uh, little, little tiny bedroom here. But if I go in the subway, I can't tell you I've never thought about pushing someone in or jumping in right in, into the tracks. But I say, oh, that's weird. I'm probably not going to do that. And then I move on with my life. Someone with OCD that's scared of harming themselves or others are going to be, oh, why did I think that? Does it mean I'm actually going to push them in? Let me step back further, and then I'm going to wait for the train to come. And when the train comes, I'm going to lean against the pole or hold it to make sure that I don't do anything impulsive. And then when the doors open, I'm going to get in as quick as I can to make sure that I don't push anybody in between the gap. Yep. Um, yeah. yeah. So, But a lot of these thoughts we we all have, crashing our car, um, sexual orientation thoughts, uh, uh, var- various, they're har- harming a baby. Uh, people th- hold a baby and think, wow, like I, I could hurt this baby, right? That's having, that's having a harm. Thought. So we all think these things. Yep. And th- those are the seeds of obsessions. It's as I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, the problem is not that you're having the thought. The problem mm-hmm. is that a person with, you know, with OCD, they interpret that thought. They, they they relate to it in an unhealthy way that leads to the anxiety and the compulsions and all that. Okay, so to to roadmap it just quickly before, because I want to jump into assessing it. Yeah. Um, OCD has the obsession, which is the fear, the compulsion, which is the behavior to erase the fear. The obsession could be a fear of something happening, or it could be a sense of disgust or discomfort or things not not being right. And the compulsive behaviors could be something physical outside of your body, uh, like like some of the things I just discussed and uh, said in the subway, or it could be mental, where you count numbers or you have to undo thinking thinking a thought. Oh, I just I just thought of a man, so now I need to think of a woman, or or vice versa, um, or I just thought a, um, a moral morally incorrect thought, so I need to think a morally correct thought. I just had a racist thought, so now I need to say an unracist thought. I, I'm beating. I'm, 
going too far to that. But but, but uh, so so it has that. There's a sense of wanting certainty that the bad thing is not going to happen. The bad thing often could be related to ruining your or someone's life or having some sort of um, major consequence. And there's some sense of redoing a behavior, these behaviors over and over again in order to neutralize that emotion, which in fact just makes the OCD grow rather than shrink. Yep. Uh, anything that I'm missing in that summary? Because I just did it off the top of my head. Yeah, no, I mean, you nailed it. That is the essence of of, of OCD. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when it comes to diagnosing OCD, what are some of the top recommendations that you have in order to do this in an accurate way and help you do the differential diagnosis between this and say a GAD or social anxiety or some sort of other anxiety? Yeah. So, you know, there, the, the, the way that we diagnose is clinical interview. Um, that's probably the most important uh, you know, way that we have of diagnosing and asking, you know, the kinds of questions to get at exactly the scenario that you just kind of walked us us through. Like, is th is this how things are, are are playing out? So, you know, what I'll do if someone says, you know, I think I have OCD or um, if I'm asking them questions and they seem, you know, to maybe have this, you know, walk me through what was the first sign of trouble and, and what did you do next? And how did that make you feel when you did that behavior? And what did you tell yourself? And you know, and if they're telling me a story that's similar to what you were just describing, Jason, then, you know, I'm probably going with with OCD. So clinical, you know, a, 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 an expert, someone who knows how to spot it um, is is what you need to, you know, get that information and assess assess for the presence of it. But then we also have other things that we need to know, other parameters. So how severe is it? How much time does it take up? How much does it interfere with functioning? Um, how much does the person, you know, um, get distressed over the over the obsessions and, and all of that? And we have a handful of different measures to help us understand that. We also have, and we'll, I'll get back to those in a second. We also have, you alluded to this, there's the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale Symptom Checklist, Y box. Symptom checklist, which is a list of, I don't know, it's like 60 to 70, like a list of all the different types of obsessions and compulsions. And actually it's, that's old. That was developed in the eighties and we should probably update that. Maybe it has been updated more recently, but you go down. Do you have obsessions about this? Do you have obsessions about that? You know, you define obsessions and compulsions for the person you're interviewing. And then you ask, do you think about this a lot? And then same thing with compulsions. So you can get a list of the different things that the person is worried about. And then you can find out, uh, there's a, there's the, the Y box also has a severity scale. It's 10 items and it assesses how much time and interference and distress, how much the person tries to control or, or has trouble controlling the obsessions and compulsions. And that gives you a score from zero to 40. To, uh, zero to 20 for obsessions, zero to 20 for compulsions. You add it up, you get a score from zero to 40. And that is, you know, they call it the gold standard way of assessing OCD there. The Y box is not perfect. Um, there are some issues with it. Actually, um, if you go to the website for the IOCDF, we did a research roundtable a few months ago uh, where we had... Um, uh, Oh, now I'm forgetting his his name. The guy uh, that invented the Y box. Um, it's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, nope, nope. Wayne Wayne Goodman is the there psychiatrist. He's now at, at Baylor University in in Houston, and we had him on our our program. You can find it on on YouTube, uh, talking about what are some of the you know uh, strengths and limitations of the Y box. But anyway, if you have a score of like 18 in that neighborhood or above, usually we would say that's severe enough to have OCD. That's a clinical interview. Um, and it, you know, again, going through the checklist, going through the 10 items, really as the clinician, it gives you a lot of information about the person's experiences, their behaviors, their obsessions, things like that. There's also a handful, a dizzying array of self-report measures that, that you can that you can give the obsessive compulsive inventory um, our group devised one called the D dimensional obsessive compulsive scale the docs and there's probably you know 10 um, other ones as well and they all have their strengths and limitations um, but a combination of an interview and these kinds of scales are what 
are what we use to diagnose OCD. There is no medical test. There's no blood test. There's no saliva test. There's no brain imaging test. You cannot, uh, there's no genetic test. You can't take a person's, you know, I- images of their brain or their saliva or blood and say, oh, that person's got OCD versus something else or even versus not having any psychiatric disorder. We just, we're not, we're not there. I don't think, I don't think we'll ever be there. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that maybe we can talk about later on. But um, if anyone tries to say, you know, oh yeah, we, we do uh, neuroimaging to establish a diagnosis of OCD, don't do it. You're wasting a lot of money and time um, because the best way that we have of diagnosing it is a, is a clinical interview. That's really the, the only way of, of diagnosing it. And uh, what, one caveat to, to say about these um, OCD uh, measures, and it's not just OCD, yeah. is that just because someone scores high on it doesn't mean that they necessarily have the diagnosis. And a lot of, you know, a trainee will come in and say, oh, wow, it's 22 on this scale. Look, they definitely have OCD. But I could give an example um, uh, on, on um, I think it's the OCI-12. Uh, yeah. I, uh, th- I think there's two, there's two measures, uh, sorry, there's two items on there that, that say, I have intrusive thoughts that make me distressed, basically. Yeah. If you have PTSD, you will have intrusive thoughts right. that will make you distressed. So um, a caveat here is it is a tool to help color your clinical judgment and your interview, but it is not a pure diagnostic measure. Someone doesn't elevate and you have probability numbers like cutoff numbers. If this person has a score over this, there's an 85% chance that they will fall into this bucket and a 15% chance that they won't or something like that. I don't know the numbers. You'll know the numbers, but 15% is not um, negligible by any means. Oh yeah. No, you never want to use one self-report measure to make a diagnosis it can be it can give you a hypothesis that maybe the person has it and let's go and you know get some sort of screening with a professional and expert but no you'd never want to use a self-report measure alone to say that you've got a you've got ocd Mm -hmm. yeah and and one thing i like about the measures um that that you had worked on is so like the the why box it says it literally is the word obsession in the question or compulsion in the question meaning that the person needs to be informed and understand what an obsession is versus a compulsion, which, I mean, most people pick up pretty easily, but if they don't, uh, it, it, it's very, um, it asks about your obsession and your compulsion versus the scales that, that, that you work on, and you might maybe list them out so people could find them. You actually list out the symptoms uh, that are obsessions and types of compulsions that people could then rate, which I think is a little bit more approachable if you're unaware of what you have or if you're unaware of the terminology. We deliberately did that for the reason that you're uh, saying, and also because we use these scales in research, and we know, as we were talking before, everyone has obsessional thoughts sometimes, and everyone does compulsive behavior sometimes. And so these scales will will be applicable to to anybody. It's just a matter of like the d- degree and how often and how intense these these things are. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the side of assessment, I'm thinking about some of the, the questions or things that I look for. And you said one of them, which is the amount of time that, that you're doing it. Yeah. Okay. You don't, you don't like your nose. How much time do you, how much of, of your day thinks about your nose? Well, I check it throughout the day. I wonder if people are looking at my nose. I'll look in the mirror to the side over and over again, uh, in order to see my profile. And, and it's, it's a sense of like it, it, it cause a lot of people could not like their nose, but to what degree are you actually doing it? And sometimes a fear, um, I, I know we said before we distinguish like a real, a real fear versus a not real fear. But w- with OCD, it can be a real fear, but the idea is the probability of the fear and what you're trying to do in order um, to erase that fear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, and, and these are subjective calls. Mm. Right. It's not like if you're doing compulsions for one hour, you have OCD. If you're doing them for 59 minutes, you don't. Mm -hmm. Right. Another criterion in the DSM is it has to cause like marked or significant distress. Well, oh, well, what does that mean? Right. That, that, that could be so for one person, but not for someone else. And how do we compare? Because distress is a personal thing. So, you know, when you're making this diagnosis, it is, um, there's so much subjectivity that, that goes into it. Hmm. Um, before we uh, 
jump off this episode and and we're going to have another episode talking more about treatment. Any last thoughts about what OCD is or assessing OCD that you think is important for listeners to keep in mind? Yeah. One thing that we haven't talked about is hoarding, right? So Mm. for, for a long time, for decades, hoarding was considered to be part of OCD. And it's not exactly clear how they got in the 80s, I think, somehow they got kind of mashed together. In the DSM, a wise thing that the DSM folks did was they took hoarding and made it a separate disorder. So there's hoarding disorder, which is not OCD. Um, although a lousy thing that they did was they included it in the OCD-related disorders. Hoarding is not related to OCD. It doesn't look like OCD, um, you know, any more than... Uh, other anxiety disorders look like OCD, which are not part of the, the obsessive compulsive related disorders. Um, you know, you can sometimes have people with OCD who, who hoard, who collect stuff, who are afraid to throw things away. And you sometimes have people who have hoarding disorder with obsessions, what look like obsessions and compulsions, but these are separate, um, these are separate problems. And we just, we didn't, we didn't talk about that. Okay. And uh, do you mind listing out the measures that your team were, were doing that we were just talking about so people could find them? Sure. Yeah. So we developed the dimensional obsessive compulsive scale, the docs, and that's available on, on, uh, we have a website. If you, if you search dimensional obsessive compulsive scale, Abramowitz, you'll, you should find that it's freely available. It's been translated into, you know, many, maybe like 15 different languages and you can find all those translations and the research behind them. Um, you know, you don't just think up items for a scale. You do careful research. It took us years and years, like five years to develop that, that measure and test it and make sure that, you know, it works. So those, that's, um, a scale that we developed 2010. I think it was published more recently. Um, I have worked with Dean McKay at Fordham University and Amitai Abramovich. No relation, but we have very similar last names. Maybe we are related somewhere. Maybe you are, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he's at Texas State University. And the three of us, um, we didn't really develop the scales, but we took a longer measure, the obsessive compulsive inventory, the OCI. And um, it's kind of long and it was redundant and there were some issues with the with the scale that were well known in the in the research. And we boiled it down to 12 items. So it's a lot easier to give in clinical settings and research settings. So that's the OCI 12. Again, you can find that online. Type in obsessive compulsive inventory 12. Um, you should be able to find it. And we went a step further and we developed the OCI 4. So just four items for like quick screening in like, you know, perinatal settings or general medical, like primary care settings. And if a person endorses them, then the doctor is supposed to ask follow-up questions. Um, so again, not, not a diagnostic tool by any sense, you know, back to our discussion a few minutes ago, um, but just a screening to kind of see, do we need to follow up about this? So those are, those are the measures that we've developed that we're, we're and, happy and with. And you also worked on the child inventory too, or somebody created a child off of the OCI, correct? We, you know what? You're right. We did. I forgot about that one. Sorry, because my work is mainly with adults. So we did. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, did sure. we developed the the. Uh, I forget what that one's called. OCI. I think it's OCI CV. CV. Or yeah, child. Does version. that sound right? Yeah. yeah uh, hopefully that's right. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that that's right. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have. I think we have the child twelve item. Um, I forget if we did. We do a child four item. I forget. I. <laughs> I have to, uh, we've published a lot of stuff. I lose track. <laughs> yeah. Well, do a quick search. You can find it. I'm pretty sure that there's an abridged, like an like a OCI CV5 or something like that. Ah, and it's then the you five. Have You're right. That's, that rings a bell. Exactly. That, thank you. I'm getting old and I'm forgetful. Right. See, but I'm that, your biggest fan. I know all of your, <laughs> I know all of your measures. Wow. Thanks. Um, no, that's, uh, yeah, the, the, it's the CV5. You got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're, we're going to take a pause here. We'll be right back with our next episode, which is going to be focusing more on the nitty gritty on treatment and some maybe things that are newer in the OCD literature. 